from doing the uh, earlier presentation, which was intended for a group of uh, boat builders, it came to mind that, that I hadn't seen an analysis of uh, or an investigation of the, of the uh, I guess, merits of various hydrofoil height control systems, ranging from surface piercing to uh, the kind of height sensor you see on a moth, for example, which is an angle of attack that's proportional to height to um, a full state feedback system that uses both, well, that uses height, height rate, and foil angle and, and gravity uh, to create a um, control action. <clears throat> And of course, the, if, if the hydrofoil doesn't clear the waves, then the hull uh, creates a, a lift force, or if it flies out of a wave, uh, gravity pushes it down. This is the uh, equation for height. Height acceleration is equal to a constant, which is a function of the uh, coefficient of lift, speed, and area, and that sort of thing. Uh, times the angle of attack relative to the boat reference frame uh, minus the, uh, the, uh, the flow angle and gravity. So the, the simulations that I'm going to show are all a function of this, this equation. So, so we have some examples. Let's see if we can get these to work. Here's a Small boat in relatively small waves, um, surface piercing, pretty smooth. And here's a large vessel in large waves, not so smooth. What speed was the boat going there, Harry Ruffin? I don't actually know. Okay. But it looks to me like probably in the 30 knot range, but I don't really know. Right. Okay, here's um, my own boat, I guess in the uh, mid 1980s with a proportional um, foil angle on control to height. <clears throat> and I'll show you the mechanism in a moment. But it, it shows the boat going through some wakes. <clears throat> and this has a, a feedback of, of one tenth radiant per foot of height, which turns out I think is a fairly strong feedback for height. What size outboard engine was that? What was the rating, Harry? Uh, 25 horsepower. This is going about 15 knots. It's uh, much slower than it would have been without hydrofoils. The hydrofoils are intended for one purpose only, and that is to test the control system. And so they're uh, uh, very high drag. <clears throat> and I might add, slower is safer. <clears throat> <laughs> One of the other features of this boat is that it leaks pretty badly. And as a consequence, one was highly motivated to fly.
This is the mechanism on the bow of that boat. You notice that the angle attack of the height sensor uh, goes to zero for higher at the top of the wave and is high at the bottom of the wave. <clears throat> the intent of that is to cause the, the, uh, the, the strut to go through a wave rather than go over it to some degree, if it's a very peaky wave anyway. Here's uh, the same mechanism, but on my larger boat in smooth water in this case. <clears throat> and this is at about uh, 35, well, about 30 knots probably. <clears throat> So the simulation that I'll be, be showing here are, I guess we have several of them. Well, I'm gonna start out with one with very low uh, feedback to, to angle attack. The intent of this is to perhaps describe roughly uh, the behavior of a surface piercing hydropole. Although I think this feedback is probably higher than most surface piercing field, field uh, surface piercing hydropoles would have. The next one is, uh, one ten, minus one tenth, which is the feedback that you've seen in the in the videos of my two boats, and the um, the last uh, actually two set, two sets are uh, state feedbacks, height height uh, rate, uh, angle attack, and um, gravity. Um, and I have two um, I guess uh, control objectives here. One with uh, fairly high height. Uh, weighting and one with a fairly low height weighting. Um, and we're going to look at small hydropoles and small waves, large ones, and, uh, and this range of uh, feedbacks. <clears throat> so just, that, just uh, to fix some parameters uh, to reduce the sample space a bit, um, we have both, all the boats are The pitch of the aft foil, uh, or the, the aft foil, is accelerated as a function of pitch angle and water motion. Um, it's uh, assumed in all of these cases that this is a the the aft foil is a submerged foil. <clears throat> um, we have for just purely height feedback the the low rate and then a, sort of a, and a high rate, and we, for state control we have these two equations one that Talaria uses in the videos I'll be showing you and uh, in, a lower, in a lower rate, uh, height rate um, controlled feedback. Uh, for the small craft, we have a separation of from the front and aft foils of 20 feet, uh, which affects the uh, dynamics of pitch. We have uh, a 20 knot uh, wind with five mile uh, so fetch giving us a two foot wave with a two, uh, nearly three second uh, period and two foot foil immersion. Large craft, uh, 60 feet, uh, 8.75 feet of, uh, of height and uh, nearly six seconds of period with a four foot immersion. So to describe the, the um, wave dynamics a bit, the blue line here, first of all, this first chart is the following C, and then we have a head C down here. The um, blue line is the wave surface. The, the red line is the vertical velocity of, of the water over this period, over this distance. Uh, boats moving in this direction. Uh, we see that the vertical velocity in a following C is negative over the entire uh, climbing of the uh, face of the wave in the following C. The horizontal velocity is, is negative, which means it's going in this direction during the first half of, of the ascent of the, of the back surface and positive during the uh, second half. Uh, for a head C, we have climbing the the uh, wave surface, we have uh, an upward velocity over the entire over the entire um, climb, and the uh, the 
horizontal velocity is um, is positive for the first part of the wave and uh, second part of the climbing it's negative. So looking at some simulations so height, we have again the blue line is the, the wave surface. We have the, the height, the simulated height of the bow foil. We have the angle attack in green relative to the boat uh, frame of reference. And in red, we have the angle attack of, uh, of the foil relative to the water flow. And so for, since this is a, um, a control feedback that is uh, related to, the, is a function of the, the height wave difference, the height wave difference here is zero. And at this point here, we have a, a zero um, angle attack plus the angle attack to create lift. Click the wrong way again. Um, and then of course this difference here has between the green and the red lines is, uh, is a function of the, the water flow in the wave. So as figures of merit, uh, let's see, I guess, yeah, it doesn't show on, okay, this one. And anyway, similarly um, for uh, a head C, we, we see that the, uh, of course, the, the, the encounter frequency is much higher. Uh, the wave, um, the, the boat uh, vertical velocities are higher and accelerations are higher. So we have a, a 0 0.7, 0 0.27 G acceleration for following C and a 1.2 G acceleration for head C. And the other figure of merit is, uh, is the wave clearance, which is the, the difference between the boat height and the wave height times two. Um, so this is basically a, a, a number that would imply the, something close to the, or relate to the strut length. <clears throat> okay, here we have the same small craft, but with much higher feedback. And then following C, we see that the, the boat height tracks pretty closely the wave height, and it does so similarly for in a head C, uh, and the uh, accelerations are, of course, much higher, uh, but the, uh, the strut lengths, of course, are, are a good deal lower because uh, the, the boat's basically following, following the wave. <clears throat> Here we have a large craft with a very low feedback. This might be similar to a, a surface piercing hydrofoil. And we see um, a, ver a very large difference as we climb out the, the uh, uh, following sea wave between the height of the boat and, uh, and the wave surface. And of course, this is shown in the videos as the boat crashes into the wave with uh, lots, of, uh, lots of spray. And ahead sea, the boat tends to ride up and over the waves uh, much faster with, of course, much higher accelerations. And uh, the this, this strut length here would, if, if uh, surface pressing hydrofoils were well off the water, of course, they would splash. And this 12 feet versus 4 feet is an indication of how much, or 12 feet is an indication of how much higher um, surface pressing hydrofoils would have to be. Here with the high feedback rate, um, we see that the, the boat uh, tracks the wave pretty closely, uh, both in following seas and head seas. And, but um, the acceleration here is low because uh, the encounter frequency is not particularly high and it's high here because of the high encounter frequency. Now for state feedback, um, which pretty much requires a, a electronic system. We have a control action, which is a function of the height, the height rate, uh, the angle of attack and, um, and gravity. The angle of attack as uh, Gustav mentioned could be um, either from a sensor on the, uh, on, on the foil or it can be computed knowing the um, acceleration and uh, and velo height, velocity, and, and uh, boat speed. So 
So here we have um, the controlled gains that Tularia uses. Um, and we have, uh, you know, for, for small craft, uh, the wave velocity and the, uh, of course, the height of the boat, very, very low accelerations. And of course, you need lots of uh, strut for wave clearance. And similarly in the head sea, very low, low, higher accelerations, but still very low and uh, lots of uh, strut length. For large craft, again, using Tularia's uh, feedbacks, um, we find uh, still a, a very low accelerations uh, and of course, much larger uh, strut lengths. Here's Tulare and uh, some uh, not, not particularly large ways, but uh, the largest ones I happen to have a video of. This simulation is with a lower uh, height penalty. And so the, the coefficient on height for control is, um, I guess I have a little less than half of what, uh, what it was in the video you just saw. Uh, we get uh, very low accelerations and basically the same uh, strut length because uh, the, the height variation is so low in the boat uh, for uh, following C for head C. Uh, Lower accelerations, not, but but still, uh, I guess we, uh, high enough that you would feel them, along with um, the. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is um, this is for a uh, a large craft, and this is for a small craft. I've abbreviated these simulations just to save time, um, and so this one, of course, has large strut lengths, but still low um, vertical accelerations. Here's a table that shows all the simulations I've just shown. We see that boats, uh, the accelerations uh, drop as, as one goes to the more, uh, uh, goes to the uh, uh, larger state and a larger number of variables in the state equation and the control equation. Um, of course, the um, the strut lengths uh, increase um, and head sees the same thing. And we, in larger waves, the same phenomenon, you can get uh, quite low accelerations uh, with, with state variable control, computer system type control that you can't get otherwise. <clears throat> Uh, some, I guess, summary points. Accelerations are highly dependent on speed. Uh, this was all done at 35 knots, but if uh, if I were to increase it, increase the numbers to 45 knots or something, the accelerations would be generally much higher. Um, <clears throat> if you cannot really contour over waves, particularly in small craft uh, and large craft. You can to some degree but uh, to a less degree as the speed increases. Um, let's see if we got, yeah. Who would like to ask the first question? May I? Sure, Gustav. 
Yeah. So thanks. Thank you, Harry. Um, that was that was good. Uh, one question: you, you use height and you use height velocity, and then you use angle of attack. Uh, if I understood it right, um, why not using acceleration as the last term in in that? equation I mean, you had it readily available from the extra meter obviously yeah uh, the did you say acceleration or yeah okay the uh, angle attack produces a force which is equivalent to acceleration so the angle attack is um is basically acceleration <laughs> yeah exactly i get that but uh, as you've shown um if you're running waves you, you you will have accelerations that are not driven by change in angle of attack, rather okay. by yes. okay. the waves themselves, um, which could yeah. be measured by an extra meter. Yeah, the, um, if, I guess what you're asking is, uh, why don't I take into account the control action itself in the, um, in the formula, is that? No, I think my, my, I think what I'm trying, what I'm heading at is that um, the, angle of attack, uh, I, I see that it's a sort of a proxy for acceleration in a way, uh, for height acceleration, I should say. So change in, um, in, in height speed, uh, if you like, uh, which an extra meter input would be as well. You don't have the, uh, it's, it's unless you deriva make a second derivative of the, of the sonar, um, you, you don't have the, the, the height acceleration, if we, if we call it that. But we have found that using the extra meter is sort of gives in high waves a, a better result than than uh, than trying to just listen to the to the angle of attack. But so it would be interesting to see well, um, the, the the angle of attack is largely calculated from the acceleration because they don't have a sensor on the foil. So I I think um, okay I think that 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 term is is actually uh, using acceleration um, okay or minimizing it put it that way so right I think, right i think uh, i think i think it's the same thing uh, okay cool my impression so it. yeah and it because one of the things we want to do in the future is to really get the height acceleration sort of the true height acceleration um, but then uh, you need proper sensors for that and a low sample rate uh, sonar would not really give you that. So um, I, I think that that could improve the whole the whole control, but it would be interesting yeah. to hear your, your views on that. The, the, um, I, you may be getting at this, I'm not sure if I can put some words in your mouth for a moment. Uh, if one knew what the, the wave itself was doing independent of, what, of the boat, in other words, one could predict the waveform, then uh, one could um, filter out the wave entirely, or let's say, via the, the estimation side of the Kalman filter. Uh, yeah. And uh, that would, um, should produce a very nice ride, I would think. Yeah. Uh, I don't know of anybody who's actually done that, but I think it would be a, a very nice mathematical exercise um, yeah. to do you know, figure out an estimator that would pick up the, uh, the height sensor readings and, and predict the waveform. Um, yeah. On Spear. If I, yeah. if I got out of I've got to contribute to both of these questions. Um, the, uh, uh, in your equations, the H dot over V is the flight path angle. And I think the angle of attack you're, you have is both the due to the uh, angle attack of the whole boat and the control action, right? Uh, the angle attack is the angle attack of the foil relative to the boat frame of reference. Right, okay. So I, I think what, when you're running it at a constant speed, the angle of attack is nearly constant. Yes. And, um, and, and so the, the pitch attitude is the sum of the flight path angle and the angle of attack. So, um, so what I think what you'll find is that if you were to use pitch feedback, pitch attitude feedback, 
it is equivalent to using uh, height rate feedback. Oh, well, that sounds like an interesting. And, okay. and of course, pitch attitude is very easy to measure with an IMU. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so you can include uh, pitch attitude feedback and, and you can also include the accelerometer by, by using uh, a complementary filter. So you can combine your height sensor, the pitch attitude sensor, and the accelerometer uh, in a complementary filter, and and get an estimate of the uh, of the height, the height rate, and uh, height acceleration if you wanted uh, from that. That uses all three sensors in different frequency ranges. So okay. at low frequencies, it's predominantly dependent on the height sensor itself at middle frequencies on the pitch attitude, and then at very high frequencies, the accelerometer. Okay. And you can arrange these crossover <laughs> frequencies uh, to filter out uh, the waves that you want because only the height sensor course is actually seeing the water surface. So if you arrange the crossover frequency so that that low frequency corresponds to the ways that you want to contour. And then uh, you're getting most of the higher, you know, the middle and higher frequency information from your inertial sensors. Then you're going to platform those itself at all. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so you can, you can use this in a uh, very straightforward way. The beauty of the complementary filter is uh, you don't have any phase lag from the height rate uh, feedback that you get from the complementary filter based on pitch attitude compared to if you're trying to differentiate a height sensor, for example. So you can, you can get all three of these feedbacks uh, from the complementary filter with, uh, with very little phase lag. So you get good stability in your control loop. Well, that, that would be a good thing for me to uh look into it, put it that way. Right. Um, and Tom. And, and, and the, the designing the complementary filter is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, so in your, in your transfer function, you simply write uh, the equation for the denominator and the numerator is the same. And then you substitute in uh, your, your various sensors. For example, so for example, let's say you had a, um, uh, a third order polynomial for the uh, that you want to have for your, your filter characteristics and that has say three real roots to it. So you use that in the denominator in, in, in the uh, numerator and then you, you um, in, in your numerator where you would have uh, like an S times H, you know, you put in a, a theta uh, times velocity there. And likewise, where you have an S squared times H, you put in the uh, accelerometer uh, term in there. And then you, you uh, do a partial fac uh, fraction expansion and you'll end up with the three transfer functions that you need for your three sensors. And uh, when you add those together, you'll, you'll get your the information you want. Tom showed me the complementary filter um, 10 or 20 years ago, I'm not sure how long. But, but some time ago, um, my background is, is entirely in state space. And, um, and that's, so I, that's why I haven't ever pursued it. But um, this is a, a much uh, more complete discussion of it than I've heard before. So, so it uh, is something that I could, could well do in the next few months. <clears throat> yeah, it would be interesting to, to uh, continue that discussion. Uh, we, I see, see we have Christian uh, online from Candela. Maybe you want to throw in something. I got lost in all the mathematics here. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, you mentioned you, in your presentation that you were using a complementary filter. Yeah, we do. The Candela controls, right? Yeah, yeah. so for the, um, for the um, height. Uh, well, yeah, actually, for the height uh, velocity, we use that. Um, uh -huh. Basically, just um, the uh, uh, integration. We, we integrate the actiometer, uh, and and then we uh, take the derivative of the of the ultrasonic, uh, and um, 
and obviously uh, when you have integrated actometer uh, it's gonna get uh, an increasing bias on it and um, so so you, so there the complementary filter is it's useful to to uh, basically high pass filter the uh, the integrated actometer um, yeah so i think if you just look at adding pitch attitude in there instead of yeah. differentiating things it, you'll you'll get a nice complementary filter that works well for height control yeah Christian, any views on that? Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, yeah, I should maybe just present myself. So I work for Panda as well. I am a control sensor engineer. So it's, um, it, it's, I mean, yes, we looked into that as well. I've also run simulations on it. So it's basically like a, a MIMO system where you both, um, because as I basically mathematically proven this, that the pitch and the height are coupled. So yes, that is the proper way um, because you cannot control pitch without also controlling height. But right now, no, we don't do that because especially what we saw is that the, the pitch movements are much, um, we won't, yeah, maybe. No, we don't do that at the moment, but no, if you have a, um, but it could easily be incorporated, but it, uh, it needs some, um, you need a good model of the system, how the pitch and height are coupled. We have another comment or question? Um, Martin. Bill? Martin. So, Harry, I'm curious whether you've used your simulation models on Talaria 4 itself and, and whether you've ever attempted to match up what the simulation says the behaviour of the boat is compared to what you see in real life. Uh, this set of simulations I did in just the last few weeks and okay. uh, since, since the earlier presentation. And so I haven't uh, looked at how they compared to let's say actual data on Tolaria you know, at all. <clears throat> Fair enough. Another? Hmm. I, I will ask another in that case, Bill. Um, something that was mentioned at a presentation given by um, Luigi and Francesco um, from Marin a couple of weeks ago, um, they're, they're certainly in their research uh, at Marin looking at uh, ventilation and cavitation and how to better predict that um, numerically. But they made an interesting observation that if a foil ventilates with a normal control algorithm, the, you know, the hydrofoil is going to dive down because it's lost lift and the control strategy is going to say put more angle of attack on, but it's actually counter to what you want to try and do to shed the, the ventilation. Um, it just made me think, well, so, so I guess those guys are saying you, you could work on smarter control algorithms that can even anticipate I've got ventilation. Um, but yeah, I'm curious what you guys think about the feasibility of, of having such a smart control system that it actually has a, a sense of what's going on with the falls themselves. Yeah, maybe I can try to say something. Sure. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's, um, yeah, ventilation is a, is a difficult topic if, if we start there. Um, um, uh, I think the, the, uh, the, the loss of lift and the event that you see then when the boat goes down, it's so fast. So I think it's hard to, to recover that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm really not an expert on sort of the times we're looking into when it comes to to flushing the fall and get rid of the of the air bubble on it, but it seems to me like that takes a while. So even if you would respond in a proper fashion, if you have such fast actuators, which they would need to be super fast, um, I'm not sure you would be able to to make it anyway. But but yeah, if yeah, maybe they can find that in the simulation. But have they done? Uh, uh, CFD analysis of, of, of the ventilation phenomena as such, or? Um, they've, they've done a combination of CFD and model testing. So they've used t okay. uh, production T-foils, I think from a uh, foiling moth or something like that. Um, yeah. It's been very much pilot studies where they're trying to explore what is possible these days compared to, to years ago, now that CFD is available. Um, but yeah. it was just an interesting observation they made that you know, the control strategy, if you know what is really going on with the dynamics, 
could be actually quite different than the sort of uh, more basic control strategies that have been used right. in years gone by. Yeah. But maybe a question to Tom here. Uh, I know you're strong in, in uh, pedophile design and uh, you're trying to find sort of uh, knowledge around ventilation and haven't really found the holy grail in terms of knowledge. Um, but the, the problem we have is this, uh, and, and that's mainly related to the struts. Uh, if we run in, in, in warm water, uh, the viscosity is, 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 um, is lower. Uh, and then it, and then it all works fine. And then when we encounter uh, cold water like five degrees, then the viscosity uh, uh, increases. And and uh, as I've understood it, the the uh, uh, the um, uh, you get more laminar flow, and then you pass sort of the thickest point of the foil, and then you get easily uh, ventilation because uh, laminar flow is more prone to to uh, to get a negative velocity gradient uh, on on the surface, but uh, the and and we want I mean uh, if we run like thirty knots as we do we want us to have as thick struts as possible um, and since I mean if you have a sixteen percent sixteen percent strut uh, compared to a twelve percent strut with the same cord the the structure or the the inertia is is cubic. So you get massively more strength in such a strut. So the only way, if you go for a 12% strut, you have to increase uh, the cord massively, and then you increase your drag massively, basically. So do you have any views on that? I mean, is there any profile changes that could be done but keeping a high thickness uh, of a strut uh, while avoiding uh, ventilation at uh, cold conditions? Right. The, the guy that is probably the, that I can think of as most knowledgeable about ventilation would be Constantine Matviev at Washington State University. But um, the, this, this, uh, this tension between the foil thickness and the structures is uh, something that was very much in play on the America's Cup teams. You know, the, yeah. the foil, yeah. you know, the hydrodynamicists and the structures guys were always trying to push that thickness in opposite directions. Yeah. Um, so, but as I understand it, and I'm certainly no expert on ventilation, but there are certain necessary conditions for ventilation. One yeah. of those is you must have flow separation. Yeah. And as you're talking about the, uh, you know, laminar separation uh, satisfies that criterion. And I, I've also had I uh, heard anecdotal feedback from moth sailors that say that ventilation is different in cold water versus warm water. So yeah. they're experiencing something similar. Uh, on the America's Cup campaigns, one of the big questions and sort of controversies was just how much laminar flow can we achieve on the foil? And, yeah. um, and, and that, you know, what evidence pe people have gathered seems to indicate that transition occurs much earlier in water than it does in air. So many of the laminar flow results that you get from wind tunnel testing, for example, may not be very applicable to water. And, um, but the, the thing about laminar separation it, and laminar flow is that if you don't want it, you can get rid of it fairly easily. So, um, so you could de design your section uh, that use uh, that assume turbulent flow for the pressure recovery, the, the, the increase in pressure on the aft part of the section, and then use some sort of a trip uh, on the foil forward of that so that you ensure that if you do have laminar flow, you've tripped it to turbulent before you begin that section. So, um, right. So yeah, you, you probably seen... designed a section that would uh, give you the you know more thickness um, and and still maintain attached flow. Uh, you might have to to uh, use an artificial boundary layer trip, which would add a, a very small amount of drag, uh, certainly right. a lot less drag than increasing the cord of the foil, yeah. and it it's easy to test on an existing foil because you can just put some tape on the foil that yeah. act as the trip 
and mm -hmm. and see if it improves the behavior in cold water. Yeah, we, we have tried with uh, making the struts a bit rougher. Um, we haven't seen massive results from that though. Um, and now it's cold outside and I, I last weekend I was out with one of our boats, uh, went to our summer house and, and, and the boat is kind of dancing around a bit when it's roughly five degrees in the water. So, so it's really, the phenomena is really there. Um, have you seen anyone dealing with moving the thickest point of the section backwards? Uh, now I think we are at like 35, 40% or something. Okay, um, so that's a very front loaded foil, yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah, so moving the, the thickest point backwards because one of the criteria for separation is that you have passed the thickest point to get a negative. It, um, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not thickness per se. It's the, it, it, but it's the increase in pressure. And, um, and so when you move the max thickness back, what you're, you, what you, you can think of it this way. There's, there's, there's a certain minimum pressure on the foil and the pressure at the trailing edge is near the ambient pressure. So you have to, you have to have that increase from that minimum pressure to essentially near ambient. And so you could do that with a, uh, a long gradual increase, or you can do that with a short steep increase. And right. my thinking was that you would, if, if the, I think the reason as I've understood it is that you get more laminar flow. So the sort of the transition happens later. Uh, and, and with higher viscosity, you then pass kind of the, the thickest point of the, of the strut and then, and then the likelihood increases drastically. So the strategy would be then to, to move that thickness backwards of uh, the thickest point, and then you could deal with a higher percentage of laminar flow, basically. Right, and that's, that's yeah, that's right. That's usually the strategy for, for reducing the, the skin friction drag. Um, assuming that you can get the laminar flow. And that's, that's been the, the big question in water, it's just okay. how much laminar flow can you achieve? Um, and, right. and it may be affected by things like water quality, you know? So yeah. what you can do at a, at a nice freshwater lake may be very different from what you get, uh, you know, going around the harbor in Stockholm. Um, yeah, true. But- uh, Although we, we, we clearly see that it's, it's temperature driven. Um, right yeah so so that i mean yeah. moving the max thickness back yes can extend the laminar flow but it also means a shorter steeper pressure increase which makes your separation problem harder if, if that's what's what's driving your ventilation yeah but i've learned that and i don't know if it's true but what i've seen uh, in in some of the papers there is a talk about the the likelihood for or turbulent flow to to separate is a uh, one order of a magnitude less than laminar. Yes. So so it, it it seems like once it's turbulent, it will not really separate unless the profile is crazy. Um, right, and that's that's the whole idea behind the bondolier trip and the the roughness that you tried. Yeah, true. Um, yeah. Very yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, uh, one of the things I noticed when looking at uh, Little Squirt was its uh, front struts. They were essentially a wedge back to maybe 80 to at least 80 percent of the of the cord, followed by a very short uh, going back to zero thickness. Uh, I found it, uh, I guess we'll say, very unusual. I was wondering if. Uh, Tom perhaps had, would have any comment on that. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I just I'd have to see the the section, but um, but you're if if it's sort of a is sort of a diamond shape then. Uh, yes, but the you know the, the diamond part or the maximum width was at least eighty percent of the cord. Right, so it almost sounds like a base ventilated foil. It, it, where, it, it, you, it looked like it could have been base ventilated, yes. Right. Yeah, so, then they should so, cut off the lost part, probably would be better. Right. Well, yeah. So, 
I mean, that, that would make sense for a very high speed foil where you're concerned about cavitation. Okay. And, uh, and you know, a, a, a base ventilated foil will have less drag than uh, a foil that has the, the base cavitated. So, uh, simply because air pressure is higher than water vapor pressure. Right. If it wasn't, the oceans would boil. <laughs> so, uh, so, so if you put that air pressure on the on the base, the backside, then you get less drag, uh, but only less drag in comparison to what you would have if that were cavitated. Uh, it'll be much higher drag than what you're going to get with a, a subcavitating foil and and a smooth wetted flow okay. towards the trailing edge. Yes. As I said, it was, I know uh, I know that strange. foil twister foil twister. Um, as you may have seen online, they, they use base ventilated uh, struts, at least in the in the front. Right. Um, and um, and it, if you take the, the structural element into the equation, uh, it, it's not, I mean, the calculations we have done suggest that the difference in drag is not massive if you go for base ventilated, because if you want to have the same bending stiffness, right, right. Uh, if that's is sort of the starting point, which is must be if you talk about struts, they only dare to take, I mean, this is a structural part only. Uh, they serve no other purpose. So, uh, and uh, if you run at, we, we run at like 50, 60 centimeters below the surface. Um, and, and then the, um, the the pressure drop you get behind the the, uh, the strut is not, is not very large. So, the additional drag is, is not uh, very big because you have more uh, thickness sort of along the court, so to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that, that, that you know, the reduction in, in wetted surface for the base ventilated foil can, uh, can you know, might make it pay off, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More comments or questions? I think maybe we're just about at the end of the hour. We should call it quits, but again, an extraordinary um, discussion. I think this has been a really, really good uh, day, a very good session as far as the, uh, the amount and the quality of the discussion. It's very educational. So um, we'll call it a day, but before uh, I do, I, I wanted to point out that on Thursday this week, we have our next session. It's going to be a uh, panel discussion involving Richard Stead and Carl Weisskopf, former US Navy hydrofoil uh, captains, and Elliot James, talking about US Navy hydrofoil operations and pres preservation. And I have to confess that when we were planning this whole conference, I was skeptical of this kind of um, session, thinking that it was going to be too much about nostalgia, but I can tell you it's not. It has real value for people concerned about operations and people concerned about, um, frankly, the hazards of, of hydrofoils, um, especially fully submerged in challenging conditions such as combat. So I'm looking forward to the full discussion and I hope um, Hope a lot of people will tune in. Thanks very much.